about things that are important to us, especially our health. So this format is going to be a little different than what you're accustomed to. I'm not going to lecture you for two hours on information that you may or may not know. I'm going to share some information, and then I'd like for you guys to actually get to know each other by um, being assigned to some breakout groups and kind of entertaining and discussing some of the questions that I'm going to have or pose for you at that time. So what I'd like to do is I'm going to, and you know me, I'm old and forgetful, so I'm going to try to multitask and get this done. So I'm going to be sharing my screen in a few minutes. I see Keisha smiling, which means that she knows that I'm uh, trying to, I'm going to try to get my act together over here. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to go. Let's see here. Okay. So. Can everyone see the screen now? Let me make sure that I have it. Yes, up. we can see it, Dr. Flalo. Okay, thank you, Keisha, thank you. So, perfect. So I'm gonna start basically, as Mika said, we're gonna be discussing things about black healthcare and the physical implications of racism, how it affects us. And, um, and for some of you that may not know what the experience is like, you'll probably learn a little bit about it today, either with the information I'm gonna share or with um, the breakout sessions when you'll actually converse with other people in the group to just have a learning experience. So what I'm gonna do is make sure I have this. All right, now my page doesn't wanna go down, of course. All right. My page doesn't want to go down. <laughs> <laughs> so let me try something else. Okay, I'm going to try something else. So the first part, this is going to be broken up into several sections. The first part, we're going to speak about health disparities and what that really means. And then we're going to have a meaningful discussion about it because it's important. So with health disparities, it's pretty complicated. I mean, it's not just one isolated issue that, that causes disparities. It's multifactorial. It's just so many things involved with how people experience these disparities. So across every chronic and acute health condition, racial and ethnic minorities have worse outcomes than their white counterparts. Studies confirm that racism in healthcare is a major part of this problem. And the racial disparities and inequities are unacceptable. We've been dealing with this for centuries and um, it's really coming to light now with uh, COVID-19 where we're seeing just disproportionately how minorities, people of color are just being impacted greatly and disproportionately by the pandemic. So racism, both structural and systemic, poverty and violence are all public health issues. The lack of access to good quality healthcare and food insecurity and so many other contributing factors are what causes the disproportionate rates of illness and disease in the black community. The obviously long-term systemic racism is now on full display since the COVID-19 pandemic started. So I just wanna share something with you. Uh, I'm not gonna do a lot of heavy data sharing tonight because that's not what it's all about to fill your brain with lots of st statistics, but I really just want to give you just an idea on what the disparities look like. So this is just a nationwide study that shows that black people are dying at 2.4 times the rate of white people. So if you just look at this on COVID-19, as you see at the top of the list there in the dark blue, uh, the black or African-American, they're dying at 93 per 100,000 people um, compared to if you look further down in the darker blue, the white is 39 people per 100,000 people. And in between those are the other brown people, Hispanic and Latin, Latino, American Indian, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander. And just a very few drop just below the white population that's Asian, but they're pretty much neck to neck there. So as you can see, we're disproportionately affected. And this is why we need to come to grips with what, what is causing all of this disparities and see if there's anything that we can do to offset that. So, you know, as we're, as we're going through this, before we break out into our first session, and you'll see on the screen, this is what the breakout session is gonna look like. And Mika dropped into the chat box that we're going to have some questions we're gonna discuss. But what I wanna do is um, 
let you know that we're going to have a nice hearty conversation about health disparities first and really maybe some of your experiences with it. But I want to share a story, um, Michelle's story. Hopefully I can get this to work. And um, it's going to be a video. And if you can't hear it, then someone might have to tell me in the chat room or maybe Mika can tell me, but I'm going to bring it up in a few minutes. So the goal for this is as we're interacting with each other tonight is really to just focus on each subject matter that comes up. And then uh, I usually have a video before it so you can get just an idea on the topic we're discussing. And then I, I put together a few questions that you can think about to discuss what it is um, that needs to take place in the conversation. So, and I'm gonna have, uh, let's see if I can do this now. All right, let's try this. The world has got to change. Hold on, that's not the right one. I live in... I'm not sure why that's coming up. Give me one second. The video is coming up for something completely In a community different. that was so prosperous with oh, doctors and lawyers and politics. Okay, this should be the correct one. I'm not sure why it's freezing, but give me one second, see if I can get this computer Tissues. to work. Now we have drug dealers in corner stores that they don't sell anything but the wrong things. You cannot deny the impact that it has on people's health. This is freezing. I'm not sure. Give me one second. I apologize. Um, okay. For some reason, it's not. Okay. So now, <laughs> now it looks like I have it. So let me see if I can get it to start working. All right, here we go. Hi. Hey. Oh, this is not going to work. <laughs> you want me to try and put it on the screen? Uh, yes, please. Okay, if you can stop sharing, I'll try to. Hold on a sec. Maybe I'll stay on. Yeah, we have a message saying the audio is fine if you can't get the, the, the video. Up. I'm sorry, what did, what did you say? You can just uh, let it play the audio because we're not able to see the video right now. So okay. let's let the audio play. Um, do, do you want to share it then? Because okay. um, it's important to actually see the screen. So if you're not able to see the screen, then why don't I stop sharing? Can you bring up can you prepare that uh, first breakout session and then I'll stop sharing and uh, we'll go, because the video is important. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm gonna stop sharing. To share my screen now. You're, okay. You're done. Yes. Right. Sorry, folks. Okay. It's, it's an old computer, so be patient. The world is not to change. And you can, and you can enlarge it. Wait, let me just play it. Now, we have drug dealers, the corner food that they don't sell anything but the wrong thing. You cannot deny the impact that it has on people's health. I have been in Red Falls from the high and tired. As far as money, my mother didn't have any money. I'll say she was poor, I'll say no income. Poor we were, though. In the 50s, we didn't have any choices in foreign healthcare. The healthcare system then was limited. It was not good. And medicine cost me so much that my family said sometimes, well, I'm going to pay for my money. 
I like this. We love my daughters when they come over and we get together and we cook and prepare meals together. It's healthy. When my oldest went to college, she came back with a different diet. Now what happens is if I do a meatloaf, it's turkey instead of ground beef. You know, I make spaghetti, I make chili, stuff like that. It's with turkey and chicken. We grew up, we ate pork. Um, we ate bacon. We ate a fresh shoulder. We ate pork chops. I did not think it was not healthy eating, right? Because this is what we were accustomed to. I, I was in denial. I didn't want to face the fact that I was becoming a diabetic. The impact is the fact that my family ended up with heart disease, emphysema, diabetes, cancer. My mother's sister, her daughter died of diabetes. She was an amputee. My mother died of a massive heart attack. And To address health disparities, we need to understand why they exist, that they're not due to one single factor. They're the result of policy decisions we make as a society. They're due to the environment, health education, insurance and access to care, access to healthy food, and stress. Those stresses are actually experienced disproportionately by people who are poor and people who uh, have been historically disadvantaged in this society. Solutions to these problems cannot just be medical. And that means everybody has to get involved. If we want the nation to be strong, the people in that nation have to be healthy. They have to be well. If there's anything that we can do to stamp out disparities, we need to do it by any means necessary. Here at East Baltimore Medical Center, most of the patients are in your city. Michelle is a terrific success story. There was actually a year where she had lost her job and before she found a new one, she had no health insurance. And she still managed to buy her medicines out of pocket, paid out of pocket to come and have doctor visits. But she was really invested in her own health. That's something that Dr. Cooper's research is looking at. Why patients don't invest in their health like we wish they would. On the agenda is the community update. So I'm gonna Michelle joined our community advisory board in 2011. We provide education to the community about health and about research. We offer training programs for community health workers. We can be sure that we are meeting the needs of people appropriately and that we're not leaving out certain groups of people that have traditionally not been included in conversations related to health and health care. Our strong relationship with the community is just essential. There's no way that we could do what we're doing without their input. And my work is just one of many initiatives here at Hopkins. This is a great example of what happens when we get it right as clinicians and as an institution. I am a fighter. I am a believer. I stand for what's right. And what's right is people's health. And I will never give up. As long as I have breath in my body. One of the things that is so important is that we want to what I call a liberated future. And it's hard to be liberated when you're not up there. When I say liberated, I mean freedom to be all the way back to the When we don't deal with disparities, then what we're doing is denying people an opportunity to give back to the world. So we've got to fight it. We've got to fight it with everything we've got. Okay. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I'm not sure how much of that you got between me passing the ball <laughs> uh, to, to Mika uh, with some technical difficulties, but hopefully you're able to at least um, take in some of that information from the video. It looks like in the chat, there might've been a few people that couldn't hear it. Could you hear the majority of it? Was it too loud? Oh. I mean, too loud. I mean, too soft. Hmm? You couldn't hear it? Tama, no? Oh, it was okay. Um, it was muffled. It was background it was, noise. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I was playing it, although it was sticking, I'm going to try to do it myself. But when I was playing it, could you hear it from my computer? Okay. So let's hope that my computer is going to behave itself as I continue to share 
later. So um, what I wanted to do now is um, I'm not sure if you didn't get much out of it, then <laughs> it's going to be hard to move forward with it. But maybe you can still answer some of the questions. It was really Michelle telling her story about the struggles of of uh, living with chronic diseases, diabetes, and various other things, and trying to manage and having obstacles in the way. But participating in things like being a community health worker, um, getting involved in uh, education in, in the community and educating her, her own community, but also um, participating in her church and trying to keep everyone healthy around her. She mentioned that her two daughters, when they came home, especially coming home from college, that they came with a whole new diet. You know, they, they were eating healthier. You saw that wonderful spinach salad that was there that was being tossed. And then the daughter was mentioning that they, um, she now makes everything with either ground turkey if she makes a meatloaf or spaghetti and that they, you know, eat chicken and things like that. Mom was saying how they used to have a pork shoulder and various other things like that. So she ate a lot of pork and now she's not doing that anymore. So the daughter kind of helped her um, really change her eating habits to be a little bit healthier. So what I'd like to do is um, in your chat, um, you can bring up, if you haven't brought it up already, you can bring up your, um, I'm gonna try to bring this up. I have on my screen, it should be coming up, there is, a few questions for the health disparities piece that in a few minutes, um, Mika is going to break you up into groups, probably uh, maybe groups of four or five people. And um, you can address some of these. You'll be in there for a few minutes and you're gonna just discuss, hopefully not talk over each other, but discuss heartily things that uh, are, are in the small group. Like what are the key causes of health disparities that you think? Um, do you think the community is truly aware of all of the various um, contributing factors to their poor health, because there's quite a few things that contribute to it. What would a healthy, what would health equity look like to you? And what policies should be in place to make healthcare system more equitable for minority populations? So I'm gonna leave my screen up for a while. I am in a, just a minute, uh, Mika's gonna break you up into small groups and I'm gonna pop into the groups just so to kind of join in with the conversation. But those are the questions if you pull them up I'll leave them on my screen, but if you pull them up in your uh, worksheet, they should be there. And we'll give you about 10 minutes just to chat with that. When we come back together, I'd let's just like to hear a few key points, maybe from the each group as to what issues were raised, um, what kind of conversation you were having, if there were some really crucial things that you'd like to share with the, the larger group. So with that, um, if there aren't any questions, I think Mika's gonna break you up into small groups and then I'm gonna visit you. And then the clock will tick and we will come back together in about 10 or so minutes. So okay. see you in a few minutes. So I'm thinking about four groups and did everyone get the document in the chat? I just put it in there. So if you could open that up, I'm creating the rooms now and you are welcome to go into the room. Hi there, you guys are joining groups. Simon and Paul and Regina.
Hi, is it Regina and Paul? Are you guys going to join the groups or no? You're totally welcome to hang out here, no problem. Hey. Oh, hi. Not, not, hey. not at this current time. I'm doing a few things right now, but I'm I am listening. Okay, no problem. It's been very Thank good. You. Very good so far. Okay. Thank you for joining us. It's nice to see you there, bruh. <laughs> right on. Thank you too, sis. Oh, I I guess you can't see me, but yes, it's nice to see you. Thank you for joining. All right. right on. Hey, Regina, are you also not joining any groups? It's no problem. Just wanted to make sure you're okay. Uh, Hillcrest just to be able to see to be seen in after hours. Um, also, just health insurance. I mean, we'll talk a little bit more about the Affordable, Affordable Care Act later, but a lot of people don't have health insurance. And initially, when Obamacare uh, came into effect 10 years ago, everyone had it. And then once this new administration took uh, this mandate off, a lot of people dropped off because they couldn't afford it. Um, but the other thing, too, is people that have lost their jobs through the COVID-19 there, there goes their health insurance. You lose your job, you lose your health insurance if it was provided by your um, employer. So now you're without health insurance. Food security. So there's so many communities that just don't have access to um, good, healthy food choices. And that is part of the problem. So that is certainly something that is a, um, a, 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 basically an affects your health. Um, and then just having it in your neighborhood. I mean, if you only have one grocery store and it's five miles away, that makes it very difficult if you don't have transportation. Um, access to affordable housing. And so th this San Diego is just tough. We don't have affordable housing in here enough for everyone. And so uh, most people have to live in multiple um, families in a dwelling, one dwelling, and that can also create problems too. But, you know, you just can't, or you're going to be in a, a community that is going to be underserved and underrepresented. And that's where, where you, all you can afford. So childcare, you can't get to the clinic or to, the, um, to any kind of a specialty appointment if you don't have any way of taking care of your child or children, especially if they're not in school at the time. You know, I'm talking about not pre-COVID, but just in general, if you have no one to keep an eye on your children, you can't get to a doctor's appointment. Education and actually um, being informed about your healthcare needs, that's important. So if you don't really know what is what is important to stay up on your preventative health measures and things like that, you can fall behind and get into trouble. Obviously income is a huge one. Um, and if you're unemployed, that makes it very difficult to be able to seek or even be interested in health. Cause right now you're just trying to find a job and make a, a honest living so you can feed your family and keep a roof over their head. And, um, the environment. I mean, people take it for granted, but there's a lot of schools that in Southeast San Diego that are right next to a freeway. So all the air pollution there, or if you think about Flint, Michigan, that had the water polluted with lead and how it affected the children. I mean, it's all over this nation where we're having black and brown communities uh, disproportionately have to deal with the pollution of uh, and poor quality of air and water. And then our neighborhoods aren't safe. So if you even want to try to get out and walk a little bit or ride your bike, you know, you have to be concerned about, is there any, um, you know, is it safe? Are there sidewalks even in some areas? So that's a huge factor. And then of course the social issue, but the stressors. We live with, black and brown people live with an enormous amount of, of stress just day to day on um, their own social needs, but also, you know, their job, their health care. Um, their families and things like that. And then of course, the last one, which we, is in our face is the policing and the criminal justice. So that is just some of them that doesn't exhaust it because there's, there are certainly others, but those, those things really affect our health. And let's see if I can page forward here. There we go. 
And so with that, um, I'm gonna try to move the screen here. Social determinants of health impact the poor, disadvantaged and the marginalized populations the most. So obviously if you have money and you live in an affluent neighborhood, you have access to you know, uh, good choices of, of, of uh, food and you also can get around in your own transportation, things like that. So it definitely affects the black and brown population the most. Um, systemic racism and the policies that are instituted that we have to live under, those are two key factors that helps in, in terms of health disparities. And those are probably some of the major ones. And then of course, poor health outcomes due to chronic medical conditions. And uh, most black and brown people have one or two or more of these, and that's diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, lung disease, and obesity. And let's see here. And so what we want to do is, um, since we've kind of primed the pump now for social determinants of health, we want to just break out a little bit and, and hear what you have to say about either your experiences or how much you know about these social determinants in your circle. Do you struggle with it? Does your, you know, the, the circles that you run in, do they struggle with some of these social determinants? And there are some questions there that your groups can um, address. And that is, uh, has your healthcare provider ever discussed, oh, wait, before I do that, let me play, um, let me try to play <laughs> this, uh, this video. Let's see if it's gonna work this time. Let's see, hold on a second. Come on. Dr. Aflalo, do you want me to try and play it again or? Did it not show? Let me know. I'm not hearing anything or seeing anything yet. Oh, okay. And I'm watching it over here <laughs> by myself. <laughs> okay. Why don't you go ahead and share it? Only problem is, is they couldn't hear it from your machine, the, huh. your, your computer the last time. So, and they said it was muffled. So try. Yeah, okay. Let me stop sharing. And then you can make it a full screen when you do get it to come up. Okay, let me try to get the document. So I wasn't, I was enjoying it and nobody else saw it? No. I was having a great time over here. <laughs> I saw you, I saw you, I heard, I heard a little like, do, 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 and I said she's looking and listening and no one else is <laughs> okay. sorry about that <laughs> sorry trying to get it on the screen here mm -hmm. and then Mika you will play that one and then afterwards you'll play the second one right under it one's like a minute the other one's like three minutes okay mm. Are you, um, let's see. How is the, how is the sound on that? Is that okay? I'm gonna try. Are you on the screen? Um, I'm just almost there. I just okay. want to. Do you see that under the advanced, under share screen, there's a sound or sound, computer sound? Under share screen. Yeah, that's, that's what I was telling that girl Baldwin. Yes, I'm aware. Let's see. I'll hit that again. Can you see it? Yes. Yes, just make it a full screen. Yeah, there you go. It's our health and well being. The conditions in which we're born, grow, and live can affect us and our health in different ways. We also react to them in different ways poverty, stress, lack of adequate housing, education, 
unemployment and poor access to transport and nutritious food are some of the things that can affect our health and life expectancy. The World Health Organization recognizes that health and well-being are strongly influenced by social, economic and environmental factors known as the social determinants of health. The environments in which we are born, grow, live, work and age can have stronger influences on our health than our genetic family history or behavioural risk factors. A person's social and economic circumstances affect their health throughout their life. The relationship between income and health is on a gradient. This social gradient means that even a little bit of wealth can increase your likelihood of being healthier. A stable source of healthy food, appropriate, affordable and secure housing, education and employment, relief from financial distress, access to transport and services, loving and stable relationships, and being able to make choices about our lives means we are less likely to experience chronic conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, depression, anxiety, and other mental illness. How we are treated by and interact with others also has a huge impact. Stressful circumstances over a long time that make people feel anxious or unable to cope, discrimination, racism, social isolation, or just being treated as less than equal can lead to poor health. And the interplay between these factors and a person's socioeconomic circumstances can compound the situation. Experiencing a lot of stress and feeling unable to change things can also lead to poor health. But as health clinicians, there are things that we can do to make a difference. Look beyond the illness to see the whole person and try to understand the reality of their daily situation. Ask them what they think would make a difference to their lives and really listen. It may be that taking care of their health in the way you suggest won't be easy. It may make things more stressful for them. So try and see what other support you can offer. Advocate with them and give them knowledge on where to turn for help. Offer transport options for people to come to your service. Consider food vouchers to families who are struggling or talking to nutritionists who can work with people to cook a healthy meal on limited income. Offer education about making better lifestyle choices to encourage healthy eating. But remember that all the advice on good nutrition will be a challenge if people are living on a limited budget. Offer medications for longer periods of time for people who can't get to a pharmacy easily and refer people to other services like counselling or housing assistance. Help improve their health literacy by encouraging and working with them to better understand their illness and be more active in their own health care. Even one small action, like really listening and being compassionate, can go a long way to improving their health. Changing your practice, even ever so slightly, might mean the world of difference to someone. So if you can just leave that screen up for the, um, the group. So what we're going to do is that, oh, let me move this. All right. So do you have your questions in front of you or do I need to share my screen? I have my question. Okay. So, um, Mika, do you have, do you have the, um, can you put the slide up? Let me see if I can do this. Yeah, sure. What do you want to see? This is the one for the, um, for the, for, let's see here. I'm trying to figure out. Okay. So we did the health disparities and the social determinants of health is this one. So this, the social, I think I, if you want to put it up, the social determinants of health, that one with the just the outline on there. Okay, I'm looking at the social determinants of health. Let's see. Or I can, or I can, if I'm not playing a video, then I can share yeah, it. So. Yeah, can share your yeah. screen again if you're not, if you're done with the video. Yeah. So, um, 
Okay. So for the social determinants of health, which I'm trying to make this larger, um, we're going to just discuss that. It basically touched on quite a few things that I mentioned earlier. And I'd like for you guys to discuss uh, for a few minutes um, whether or not you feel over the, you know, in your lifetime, if any of your healthcare providers have ever discussed your social determinants of health during a visit, asking you, you know, about transportation or if you had any issues at all, or whether or not they've considered your social determinants of health when recommending a treatment plan. So if they're saying, you know, um, go over here to the fitness center or go somewhere else and get, you know, fresh produce and you don't have access to that, did they take that into consideration when they made their treatment plan? and gave it to you before they left the office. The other thing would be uh, determining what you, th you think the first three social determinants of health are the most important ones that should be addressed immediately for our communities. And then whether or not, uh, which policies you think need to be put into effect in order to make those three social determinants of health um, come, come to, to pass, meaning to, that we can actually get those addressed in our communities and make our communities healthier. So uh, Mika is going to break us out into small groups, and uh, those are the questions that you can address during this session. Okay, I'm going to open up the rooms now, and you guys have um, 10 minutes, yes? Is that right? Yes. I'm going to put in there 10 minutes. Okay, go ahead and join your groups. Hi, um, Robert, you can go ahead and join the breakout groups. I know you just joined us, but we'll see you in the breakout. <clears throat> Elaine, you can go ahead and join uh, room, what is that room you're in? In room four. Yeah, I'm just having trouble with my computer scroll pad. So let me, as soon as I can get this working again, Okay, Sorry, no I'm join. Okay. I'm just having, <laughs> I'm having random issues. <laughs> I am so sorry. I definitely like your, um, your image there. That's nice. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Love to be in some hot springs, looks like. <laughs> okay, it seems like it's working, so I will go join. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Paul, I guess you're not, yeah, you're going to be hanging Yeah, out. I bounced, I was in for a second, and then it... Oh, because I, I moved you to room three. Okay, sounds good. Okay, see you then. Can you send me an invite? Oh, it, okay, I'll do it again. Or, or maybe I can do, can I do it for, oh, I can, it says I've been assigned, oh, wait, I think I got it. I think okay. I got it. All right, see you there. Okay. I can see and um, around social determinants of health. And then the question that I posed is that, you know, why aren't policies made from a social determinants health lens? Because, you know, when you're talking about um, social determinants of health, m primarily most of the factors that Dr. Afalo shared with us, they all have this intersection of systemic racism that causes these issues. And so I'm just wondering why we aren't enforcing our policymakers to look at when they're creating policies to look at it from a social determinants um, lens in solving some of these issues that we face since Every last one of them involves systemic racism. Did I forget anything, group?
Would anybody else like to share from their group? I thought that David brought up some good points in terms of when you are exiting, you know, finishing up your appointment or treatment that the healthcare, David, you could say it better if you want to say oh, it directly. Sure. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I was really just kind of um, uh, acknowledging that, you know, given that there is, you know, so little time sometimes with our clinical providers. And if we do focus on, you know, you know, our headache this day or our foot ache or whatever it might be, there's less time to talk about the social determinants and, their, um, and the kinds of resources that are out there. So um, uh, definitely there's an opportunity to uh, both kind of train or provide the information to our clinical, you know, uh, you know, employees about resources that are out there. But also, I think there's an opportunity to create more of a, um, a referral, a seamless referral process or um, to uh, resources that are out there able to help the community. Um, I think that's where uh, there is an opportunity right now. There's a lot of folks doing a lot of good help, um, a lot of great nonprofits. And, you know, sometimes our clinical staff just don't know about them um, or it's, you know, they're just not on their radar. So, um, or they're just too busy to kind of look for the number or whatever it might be. Um, you know, in, in that sense, if it's an easier thing to just refer someone to a, a 211 or something or uh, whatever those other um, kind of uh, referral organizations that exist out there, um, we could kind of make that uh, a point for our clinical staff to, to know about. And David, just to piggyback on that, I think it's important as a provider, and there's a few other providers on the, on the um, call today, is that yes, we, we have limited time, um, but the only way to really take good care of your patient is to take the time to get to know them. So even though they only give us 15 or 20 minutes for the appointment, if you don't invest in them, then every visit is a waste of time. So I rather run a few minutes late every single time I see them, you know, run and take an extra five minutes to get to know them, to, to get to know their family, to find out where they're living, to, to start tackling those social determinants of health if they have them, so that it'll help me be a better clinician for the patient I'm, take, I'm gonna be taking care of. So it makes absolutely no sense to run through you know, yes, they're going to have a list. I was saying to one group before I got moved to another group that they may come in with a list of five problems. And then you yourself as a primary care provider have a list of five things you have to check off because that's what he just measures say. So you got to make sure they've had their mammogram, their pap smear, their colon screening. Have they had their A1C done? You know, da, 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 da. And so both of you have an, a, dis, a different agenda in that room. But the whole point is, is that at the end of the day, somebody needs to communicate because they're speaking apples, you're speaking oranges, and no one's speaking the same language. So I would say I ran late all the time, but my patients knew to bring a book. Some of them, some of them, went, some of them went ahead and had their nails done and came back. But the whole point was when I saw them, I spent time with them. It was, it was an extra half an hour, but I knew every single one of my patients. I knew their family members. I knew their dog's names. I knew when they traveled. So I could take care of them. I didn't have to be looking in a chart or anything. I knew them personally. So and if that's... you as a primary care provider don't do that, then you're doing the patients a disservice. And yeah, that's, that's what makes you a good physician. I'm exactly, sorry, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I have to say, because I know that's how you are. And that's, I feel like if you are a physician, a teacher or whatever, you should put your all in it and you really should care about your patients, just like a teacher should care whether or not their students learn. It's the same thing to me. And that is what makes you a good physician. And I applaud you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Regina. Yes. I have something to say, Dr. Flalo. Okay. I Thank think you. that um, attending things like this and your other community events um, can harm patients as well with the, the knowledge, the education to be able to. So I was sharing also in the group and it cut off that I had, I had the knowledge to ask my physician that didn't ask me but i began yep. sharing some things and um they still thought that i was healthy enough to not have to worry about that mm -hmm. but um mm -hmm. um but i was armed with it and so it's um like you say it's a two-way street yeah our providers can stand to get more training or take that time to think about social determinants cultural competency systemic racism, but it, I have a, a great 
stake and investment in my own health. And so I'm, I'm probably, I don't know, maybe I'm the best patient. I don't know. Maybe people say I'm the worst patient because I'm researching and asking them and, and, um, and questioning what they're saying to me as well. And so I have to have a stake in my, in my health as well, in my health care as well. So I think these kinds could, some people don't even know, you know, this information or feel confident enough to uh, question their physician or, you know, have a conversation about things they've seen, read, heard, or whatever. So thank you for the, the uh, physicians that take the time to educate and do these types of things outside of the, the hospital or the clinic or, or whatever, that it's important to, to get that education as well. I agree. Anybody else would like to share? Could I share something? Really? Absolutely, Kevin. So hi, everybody. My name is Kevin Liu, and I am an aspiring physician, and my mentors are in this chat, and just so happy to be here. So I, I do realize the challenge for health providers, for example, in a 15-minute visit, how many questions, how much can you get to know the patient? Um, it could be challenging. And that's why I, I find it so valuable for programs like uh, Dr. Afalo's a, a Healthier Me in the Community, and then I got to volunteer for that. And I also I was a part of uh, Dr. Ronnie Hood's Patients Health Improvement Initiative, where the doctors get to build a team and Montrula is on the uh, patient health <laughs> program. Now we have a team of people uh, coming from the community, community volunteers, there are students, uh, sometimes uh, some of the other people are retired and they really get to know the patients a lot more intimately and relay those information back to the doctors. So making each following uh, visit more uh, valuable, in, I want to say. And so I, I do think really building that community where everybody comes together, get to know their physicians, and just trying to, to, to see what are some of the barriers um, that are keeping people from staying healthy. And some of the barriers that I, I, I witnessed was, you know, lack of transportation to, to get to appointments, and sometimes is they don't even have food. So lack, lack of access to healthy food. And one thing that I mentioned, this trend of, uh, especially for the elderly, this trend of, um, that we're going into the, the digital space, right? Many elderly, they do not even know how to use a smartphone. And I was very fortunate I was able to help one of the patients to learn how to text uh, on his smartphone. And that's gonna be very valuable, especially um, if we, as we move towards more telehealth uh, style and making sure they have access to those devices in the first place. I think when we start to think about the type of policies that we should advocate for. So yeah, so there are, I, I always love to have creative solutions. And I, I do think that as long as we, um, our goals are, are there to, to show compassion. We'll find a way to, to solve these problems. And I just love, again, I love how a Healthier Me program, it, I thought it's super cool how we used kind of Dr. Hood's old uh, clinic. And after hours, we got a group together, uh, people who sign up to learn about how to prevent hypertension. And we even, uh, Dr. Afalo, uh, we, we hired or she hired a uh, fitness coach we got to do some dance inside the clinic. I thought that's super cool. I never I would have combined those two. And then also uh, she invited, Dr. Fala invited the, those participants to go on walks on the weekends. And that's actually when I got to learn about, okay, one of this participant was kind of uh, shy and maybe hesitant uh, when I, to share a little more. But on that walk, I got to learn that she's actually a Lakers fan, right? And things like that to start, building that trust, I think it's going to make the visits in the future much more productive uh, for us to really find the root causes uh, for their illness or whatnot. But thank you. And, thank I'll, you. and, and I'll just say that there's no harm in being a friend with your patient because most of my patients, since I was new to San Diego, 
all my friends in San Diego were my patients and they still are. So, you know, 25 years later, we do everything together. And so there's no harm in that. There's no, you're not crossing a line or anything. Um, and, but they feel like they can come and talk to me about anything. And so it's important to build relationships. That's the only way you're going to get the people to trust you and then to believe in you to do the things that's going to help improve their health. Dr. So Paula, can I just say something really sure. brief? I'm Bob Gillespie. I'm a cardiologist here locally. I've known Suzanne and Kevin for a long time. And one of the things that I want to echo is what they've said. You know, often patients may not remember what you tell them, but they always know how you made them feel. And so you have to figure out a way to make patients feel good up front. And one of the, the simple techniques is when someone comes in, is what Dr. Flalo mentioned first, ask about family. But the second thing, spend two minutes and not say a word. Let them talk. Don't cut the patient off. Most doctors will cut off patients within 30 seconds because they want to move on to that next topic. My rule is just if you let someone just talk and don't interrupt for two minutes, the vast majority will stop by that time. If they go a little bit longer, you go ahead and let them do that. Communication is key. All the other things come secondary to that. Then once you build that rapport, you go in and you talk about their heart disease. So I, I just wanted to echo exactly what you're saying in that not all of us will necessarily have our patients come in after hours. Some patients don't even want to do that. But every doctor can provide that one few minutes of giving their patients a chance to express themselves. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Bob. That was great. So with that, because I know we're kind of going low on time, so I'm going to try my best to um, get through some more of this. That was great sharing. I'm going to just uh, switch the topic just a little bit to um, implicit bias. And uh, let's see. There we go. All right. I'm not going to even try to make the screen bigger. You can see that for the most part. <laughs> because this computer is acting up. So um, let's see. So with implicit bias, it is, imp oops, hold on a second. What happened there? Are you still seeing the screen? We see you. Nope. Uh-oh. Uh, share, hold on one second. I think it's coming back up. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, All right. So with this, um, with implicit bias, I'm trying to get the screen up just a little bit uh, larger so I can see it personally. No, that's not it. Um, why won't this, my computer? I'm going to invest in a new computer, I promise. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, so with implicit bias, Basically, um, as many people either know or have experienced biases from one individual or another, probably on a daily basis, but just bias in general is just uh, prejudging, you know, in favor of or against a thing, a person or a group, usually in a way that is considered to be unfair. So whether it's, you know, your favoritism, you know, you have a teacher who is biased and picks on the child all the time and calls on her, you know, the other kids don't feel engage because the, the teacher's only paying attention to one or whether or not they're picking on one person and feeling that, you know, they're being targeted, but um, that's, it, it can go either way. So conscious or explicit bias, these are biases that you're aware of that are on your conscious level. It's um, a particular tendency or trend or inclination, feeling or an opinion, especially one that is preconceived or unreasonable. And then what we're going to focus most of the, this conversation is the unconscious bias. And that's really where things come into play that's going to affect our health. And these refer to, and they're implicit, refers to attitudes and stereotypes that, are, that affect your underlying actions, your decisions, and in an unconscious way. Makes them difficult to control. So if you're really not even sure that you're doing it, then it's really hard to correct a problem that you're not, not aware of. Everyone has some ingrained thoughts that lead to errors in how we perceive things, how we reason, how we remember, and how we make decisions. So your unconscious perceptions of the world around you is really what's taking place. And without even knowing it, we all possess our own implicit biases. I think half of the battle is just knowing that and coming to grips with it and figuring out on a small scale how you can start improving that. Healthcare providers should not allow their implicit biases to affect 
the care they provide to anyone, but especially to the minority population. And so um, I took a, if you go, when you have time, you can go on to Project Implicit and you can take your own implicit bias test. And it told me yesterday that um, I did not have any prevalence to one particular race or another, which is good because that's what you need for, for um, being a, a good clinician is to not play favorites. Although, you know, even though you're a parent or something, you're not supposed to have a favorite child, but every parent knows that they do have one. They just don't want to admit it. <laughs> Tell the truth, Dr. Flalo. I had so much bias. I took that test. I biased, biased, biased. <laughs> I know you did. I, I'm, ex I'm expecting everybody to use your worksheet at some point and take that test and see where you fall. So what's implicit bias? Um, you might want to, whoever, you might want to mute your... Uh, Mike, real quick. So implicit preferences uh, can predict behavior. So these manifest in workplaces like discrimination in hiring or promoting. So you can be on a job for 10 years and not get promoted. See people come in, you train them, they get promoted. So that's a preference. Criminal justice system, obviously in terms of cases and how they're sentenced, school settings, and in the healthcare system, especially for medical treatment. So implicit bias is one of the, is one of the reasons why black people are, are mistreated in the healthcare system, they already assume through you know um, the media that they see that we're, we're dangerous, that we're aggressive, you know the angry black woman, the da 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 da, whatever you think, all of those stereotypes that come with it. So if your provider it has this already in them, my goodness, how are they going to take care of you? Um, the categories that you know obviously biases come into play are race, gender, sexual orientation, your age. You know there's ageism. Um, weight, disability, your religion, and even your skin tone. So, you know, some people even when in our own category, in our own race, you know, we look to someone that's darker, you know, as being less than than someone who's lighter. And that happens even in, in you know, the black, black and brown population. So culture, your media, and the upbringing can also contribute to the development of such biases. People often don't know that they even have these biases, which makes it more difficult to remove them or improve them. So uh, let's see here, I'm trying to find my thing. And so I just wanted to share this with you. I took my uh, implicit bias test. This is what, um, this is the summary that they said afterwards. Like I said, I fell in the 18% category. So it says, um, when I took it, it said the summary of the other people. So there's, this is a group of people. I think the distribution summaries were like, I don't know, millions, 3 million or so down there. That um, it shows that most people implicitly prefers European American or white people to African American or black people. And that means that they, if you take the test, you'll see when you use the, when you check the race one, that they'll show you, and you have to do it quickly, you know, faces, part of your faces and, and words that go with it, like positive words, like, you know, pleasant or smiling or fear and all that. So they'll throw out negative words and positive words, and they'll throw out, you know, European faces and black faces. And it depends on how you do with that. So, uh, they are, what they're saying is they are faster sorting when good words and European American or white people images go with it. So if you see a European face and then you see a good word, you automatically uh, put those two together. And then, and the same thing is with the black, you see a black face and you see bad, you know, hard words, you know, angry, frustrated, depressed, whatever negative words, then you associate it with uh, the black face. And so that was part of it. So you can see that 25%, 24% strongly, well, 24, 27, and 17% all lean towards preferring um, the, the white people over the African-American. And then the ones in the middle, 18, little to no automatic preference between African-Americans and European-Americans. And then the bottom small, which is smaller, seven, five, and 2%. So I don't know if just a small amount of African-Americans that took it, or there was white people that took it and they had a preference to black people, but those lean more to automatically prefer African-Americans compared to the, to the European. So it's an interesting thing that when you have time, you should really take it. It takes like, I don't know, a few minutes. And there's in this, in this particular test, you can choose different ones. You can choose orientation, you can choose race, you can choose religion, and you can see how you feel on, on all of those levels. So it's quite interesting to take. And then, so just conscious and unconscious bias you don't realize that, um, you know, the, you may have a little bit of conscious bias. Okay, you know, I don't like, uh, you know, I know when I see patients coming in, they complain to me about other providers and how they treat them. And that could be from their sexual orientation or their weight. And so, you know, some of that from the conscious bias, 
But the unconscious bias, that's that huge iceberg underneath that people don't realize. And that's what's affecting the care that's being um, given to you through the provider who may have this unconscious bias. So with this, um, I'm not gonna try to do a video, but I do with the worksheet, uh, when you have time, click on those videos and, and go to them. They're actually pretty interesting, but I do wanna take maybe a couple minutes just to um, break out into the implicit bias group. We don't have much time, but maybe uh, seven minutes or so to just speak about whether or not, uh, if you've had any examples of your healthcare provider showing or demonstrating implicit bias and whether or not that affects you know, um, your care and you can share your own experience. Also, whether or not you feel like if a provider has shared some or demonstrated some implicit bias, does that help you? Does that cause more mistrust with your provider and with your, with your healthcare system? Is that why we black people don't wanna to go to the doctor because we just keep getting treated with such disrespect? And then ultimately can implicit bias lead to unethical treatment and or of the patient and poor outcomes? So with that, um, that's your Dr. assignment. Fine. Yes, Matt. Where's the worksheet at? I know I'm just... um, Oh, it's in the it's in the chat room. And and oh, um yeah, I'll put it back in there just in case you don't have it. Yeah, I came late. Yeah. And then she's gonna break us out into groups. And some of the other people will have the questions, so you can also um you can also they'll they'll help you guide you Definitely. through some. Okay. Meet you back in a few minutes. Okay, the rooms are available. See you there. Robert, do you want to join a room? Oh, I can't hear you. Can you take your, you're on mute. There's a, me, a mute button maybe at the left corner of your screen. See it? Hello. Hi there. Yeah, you know what happened? I um, I went to the chat room and somehow I got bumped out, pushed out. So I'm getting back here a second here. Okay, no problem. I can hear you, but I can't see you. <laughs> no problem. I'm gonna put you into room three. But you know what I'm gonna do? I'm I'm finishing up something in the office at the oh, same okay. time. So I'll rejoin you once once we get started back in the main session. No problem. I totally okay. understand. Okay.
a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was fun. I was having fun sharing in, in my groups. <laughs> so can anyone say that they have not experienced implicit bias by a provider? Is there any one? Would ones, would, is there one in the group that says that they have not experienced any kind of implicit bias, especially people of color? Tama, have you even experienced any from a provider or someone in the clinic? Well, I said, I, I mean, I didn't say that I did in our breakout session, but I was trying to think of whether I, I did um, feeling as a woman with a male doctor. Okay. Uh, so I, I do feel like I've got something internalized about that. Right, right. And, and the thing about it, and you might have suppressed it, but I can promise you that it didn't take but a half a second for any black person or any brown person on this call to have pulled up one, two, three, ten. We'd have to figure out which one's the most important one because we definitely <laughs> get uh, the implicit bias. It's like it comes in, it's the, it's the elephant in the room and you see it before yeah. the doctor even opens their mouth, their body language, their <laughs> attitude. You know, they don't even give you eye contact. They're over there on the computer typing. They don't even look at you. I mean, all of that, right? No, just the disrespect. So the fact that, mm -hmm. I mean, you, most likely you did experience it from a female perspective. Uh, and or so just imagine how a female black female feels because you're going to get the two strikes against you the black and the female and so it's a horrible experience that we have just kind of gotten used to but we should not have to get to get used to those those uh, microaggressions those traumas that we have to live with that's piled up on top of everything else including the aces all of our childhood ex adverse childhood experiences that we had. Yes. and you wonder why we're why we, we get a little bit offended or or assertive or what you call aggressive is because we've had a mountain of drama for years and then you come in in the room mm -hmm. and you just want to give us attitude it's like no you're not going out of there you going to listen to what i have to yes. say <laughs> yes <laughs> don't you, you you need to take your hand off that door because i'm not finished yet I'm yes not you have to carry me out of here. <laughs> i tell my patients to take control of the situation i empower them i'm like look your doctors, you are paying that doctor's salary, so do not let them walk out the room until your, until your questions are answered. I empower them because shame on them for disregarding them. It's like, wait a minute, where do you think you go? I'm not, I'm not finished yet. I'm yeah. sorry, you might be finished, but I'm not. And this is my yes. point. And like, if you don't take care of it, I'm going downstairs to membership service and I'm complaining about you. And I will be talking to your chief of the department too. So, anyway, that's sorry, I got on my soapbox there. That's when they call security on you, though. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they do that. But then what you have to do is you kind of have to go ahead and um, you probably have to call and file a complaint. Mm -hmm. You have to, because yeah. I promise you, there's more yeah. than one Black person that's, that's, I mean, I even have patients at Kaiser that's put on a list that they can't even come to the clinic. And all they did was just, you know, raise their voice. But these people get intimidated when you raise the, your voice. I'm like, excuse me, I don't yeah. have a weapon or anything or whatever, so what is the problem? But they, they come in in fear and anything you say, and then, you know, you can hear me, I'm animated right now, so my voice has gone up. So can you imagine if I'm in a doctor's <laughs> office and they give me some grief? You know, I'm gonna be on, on, on an octave so high. So, you know, we need to empower our patients our, our, to, to, to go and get what they need out of their visits. Do not, I tell them, do not leave your visit with more questions than when you went there, okay? Right. That's the rule. Okay. So any highlights? Because I know we got like two minutes and I'm going to go through a couple slides and uh, I didn't realize the time was just slipping away, but I'm going to quickly just go through a couple things and uh, share. And let's see, let me try to get past this. So I'm just going to run through this Affordable Care Act. You know, today the the uh, Supreme Court was uh, weighing in on this. It, it, it got signed into law by Obama in March of 2010. And you have to look at the video that I have on there, the Jimmy Kimmel Live videos, when you get a chance uh, on your worksheet, or I'll send this out. Because the crazy people say they prefer Affordable Care Act. They didn't like Obamacare because it was too expensive and all this nonsense. And they had to come back around and say, well, do you realize it's the same thing? <laughs> you know, Obamacare is... Affordable Care Act. So these, <laughs> these old prejudiced people that says, no, I don't like it because, you know, I don't like him, so I don't like his thing, but I do like Affordable Care Act, and it's, you know, it's giving me the help that I need and all this nonsense. So you have to watch those two uh, 
those two videos, they're fun. But um, so it's, you know, it's on the chopping block. I do, I do hear, I heard earlier today that, you know, there are some boats that looks like they might not have gone in that direction because um, it didn't seem like it, it was a reasonable case. So we may be able to get through this, skate through this and not, um, you know, get punished and, and take away uh, 20 million people off of the Affordable Care Act, off of their health insurance. And so Dr. that's- Follow, may uh, I ask you a question? Sure. I, I don't, I don't, I don't hear, I hear the, the, the dismantling of it, but I don't hear what in lieu um, they're proposing to provide to people. It just seems like it's just get rid of it altogether, but nothing yeah. to enhance where it's broken or anything like that, or where it's, it, not, you know, that you, it's not that you didn't hear anything for 10 years, okay. they've been trying to sure. re repeal sure. and replace. Well, they yeah. have nothing to replace it with. And that's why they haven't been able to right. successfully repeal it. And the, the longer the people are on it, the more the people like it. So they don't you take away my Obamacare. All of a sudden now they like Obamacare, right? <laughs> um, but Woo. the problem is, is they've had 10 years to think of something. They're not interested in bringing about any health care to the people. And so this, that's why I'm saying, wow. Hopefully this is not knocked down and then uh, the Biden administration will build upon it and make it even better um, yeah. and, and provide some other options to it. So yeah, they, there was never any interest from the Republican side to, to replace it with anything. Otherwise they would have done that. And remember we've been here for the last four years. Oh yeah, we'll have a beautiful, big, beautiful plan that's coming in two weeks. Well, the two weeks has been coming for four years and we have nothing. So, <laughs> you know, believe, believe not what they're saying but what they're doing. Okay, Absolutely. I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. No, you didn't miss a thing. We <laughs> <laughs> did not. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I saw something from Tama, but I didn't get to read the whole thing. So Tama, did you, um, I didn't see your thing. It just said, do I have permission to share? And I missed that part. Oh, I was just wondering if this is for the organizer for tonight, if we have permission to share the Google sheet with our indivisible, with our respective memberships for people who are here, yeah. or if you'd prefer not. Oh, you're talking about, to, um, repeat that again, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so, Yeah, if, if we have permission to share the Google sheet with our membership. Yeah. I don't know if that question is for the organizer of tonight. Mika? Yeah, that's perfectly fine. That's why we've uh, printed it or we've provided it to you so that you can use it at a later date and share it with whomever you like. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And the only thing I'm going to sum up is that, you know, we're not going to break out, but, you know, basically it's the questions that you want to think about is how do we feel about Obamacare possibly being eliminated by the Supreme Court today? Um, which population do you think is going to be affected most by it if it is eliminated? Well, I think we can answer that question, the black and brown people, 20 million and anyone with a pre-existing condition. So that 10 million that now have COVID-19 are have pre-existing conditions. So they would, they would be off of it too. And then, um, and then if Obamacare survives the Supreme Court decision, what would you like to see Biden's administration do to improve on Obamacare? So those are questions that you might want to just think about and, you know, get familiar with it because this is our livelihood. And then, um, and then you can look at the video in terms of the racism and the implicit bias and things like that. So I probably had a three, a three hour thing here, but we're now at the close. So I just have a list of my current responsibilities there. I don't know if you can, is that on the screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm just tired looking at it, but anyway, um, <laughs> it's a lot of stuff, but the one I highlighted Remember is the one that, in uh, uh, Lalo, you are retired. You're retired. You're not tired. You're retired. <laughs> oh, I, I am retired. Yeah. But I, I want to bring, bring to your attention that we're trying to bring back the monthly community outreach um, to serve. We've been serving anywhere from four to 600 people a month. So I've already got uh, permission to from the county. I don't know what it's going to do with the, with the purple tier now. But um, because it's an open event, we may be able to go ahead and do it. But we serve so many people. So I just want to say that if you are interested in coming out on the first Wednesday of the month, um, you know, put your information in the chat box okay. and we have, we can always use volunteers to help, to help set up and tear down, okay. to help with produce distribution, to help with COVID screening before they come into the, to the uh, event, to help at registration, the checkout table, okay. any people, anybody that speaks Spanish can come and interpret because we see probably about 70% Spanish speaking people there. And if you have donations or access to PPE, um, uh, or any kind of giveaways. We give away um, gifts to them if they participate. There's lots of things that are, are done there. You know, blood pressure, diabetes screening, HIV testing, hep C, 
dental screening, um, mammograms. There's a lot of services there. So we try to, and we're going to be having flu vaccines there. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, come out if you have, if you have time, we're there from 10 to three, I believe uh, on the first Wednesday of every month in the hopes of starting up again on um, uh, December 2nd, if we get a, a go and we're not back on the purple list. So, um, and so con you can contact me, but if you're interested at all, please go ahead and just um, put your information in the chat box and we'll get that taken care of. And with that, I will say thank you for your attention and for hanging in there for so long with me. <laughs> the time um, went by really fast. Yeah, that was yeah. great. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. It was really great. It was thank great. you. Yeah, it's great. Yes. Yeah. I love you. Think I love your three-hour event, Dr. Flalo. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific that you do. Yeah. That. Very nice. Thank you. So I don't know if, um, Mika, if you wanted to share your last slide or so that had some information about the follow-up things before we go. Yeah, I put it in the, um, oh. oh, do you mind continuing to share your screen? Sorry about oh. that. I, I was putting it in the chat uh, the oh. upcoming session. I think that did I stop sharing? So you can you can show it if you want to show it. Okay, no problem. As our wrap up. But thank you guys for coming. I appreciate you guys coming and spending some time. But we just needed some like, you know, too bad I don't have money to send dinner out to you guys so we can uh -huh. have a dinner at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we can figure that out next time. Thank you so okay. much. Or we can all just bring our dinner and you know. There you go. Have a meal. Have a meal. So Thank I think, you, um, everyone. I think Thank in closing, um, I, I think, Mika, did you have anything else you wanted to say um, before you close or everything is going to be in there? And do you guys want me to share the slides or something with the videos or will you have the video? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think everything is on the worksheet, Dr. Flowers. So okay. So they can get the links. I, I, I um, really want you guys to look at some of those videos we weren't able to. Uh oh, who is that? <laughs> that's, hold on. That's, a, that's probably, uh, oh, Miss Regina's granddaughter or someone there. Yeah. <laughs> That was my grandson. Oh, I'm grandson. sorry. Okay. <laughs> the only thing that I wanted to share with you all, <laughs> of course, thank you for attending our healing session with Dr. Aflalo this evening. And to let you know, um, Dr. Aflalo actually touched on it, the environment, uh, the quality of life, the quality of air, housing. And we're going to have um, John Brooks, who's an author, who's, uh, who's also a filmmaker, and he attended tempted Congress, I think this year as well, this year, uh, 2020 and back in 2012. So he's going to talk to us about environmental racism, which we're um, experiencing. And then in session eight, we're going to address the mental health trauma, challenging the biomedical model and strengthening self-care, which we all need in this time of COVID. And just in general, we're all fatigued. We're dealing with microaggressions. We're just dealing with the all of this and so, amen yeah it's a lot it's definitely a lot so um kalechi ubozo she's going to talk to us um 